Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time in your presence. Even as your word is coming with great power and might, we pray that you will help us open our hearts to receive your word as a seed that will grow and bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. We thank God for this morning. Um, last week, we started um, something on fruitfulness. Last week, I talked about bearing fruits abundantly. Today is 10th April. 2016. In case, in case you don't know today's date, it's 10th April 2016. And um, I'm still talking about fruitfulness, but today I'm talking about um, dwelling in the secret place. Dwelling in the secret place. And there can be no fruitfulness without intimacy. There can be no fruitfulness without intimacy. And fruitfulness, intimacy, is the non-negotiable key to fruitfulness. In other words, you cannot talk about fruitfulness without talking about intimacy. Even in life, you cannot talk about fruitfulness without talking about intimacy. Before you can bear fruit physically, there must be intimacy before fruit can come. Now, Romans chapter 7 verse 4 says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the Lord through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to whom who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So, the purpose or the goal of Christianity or the new birth or our union with Christ is to bear fruit. That is the goal. That is the goal. That is why last week I said that the reason why Jesus told the people that I never knew you was because he never experienced intimate moments with them so they could not produce fruit he said i never knew you and so what you did was unauthorized or lawless which means that intimacy is the key to authority when he knows you that is when he will authorize you and then what you do will be in accordance with his authorization. So, intimacy is the key to fruitfulness. Intimacy is the key to authority and dominion. So, when God told Adam to have dominion, what God wanted to tell Adam was that you will have dominion insofar as you are connected to me. That is why he gave him his image before he gave him Dominion. So, intimacy is non-negotiable when it comes to fruitfulness. The seed in us was given to us by God. It was planted by God. But that seed must bear fruit. And God has designed that the secret place is the birth chamber of fruitfulness. The secret place is the birth chamber of fruitfulness. And so we are looking at dwelling in the secret place. Unless we are prepared to enter the secret place for him to infuse us with his word and with his mind and with his ideas, we will go about doing things just because we feel like doing them or doing things because others are doing them. But when we enter the secret place and he has intimate relations with us, he releases his seeds into us. And those seeds will now begin to program the way we behave and the way we think. And that is when what we do will attract 
his glory. Hallelujah. So Jesus Christ said um, in John 15 verse 1 to 5, but the verse 5 especially, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He said, if you abide in me, then you will bear fruit. If you abide, the word abide means to remain. It means to dwell. It means to continue to cling to. Abide means to remain or to dwell. It also means to continue to cling to. So if you dwell in me, if you dwell in me, if you sleep in me, if you rest in me, if you come to my secret place and you are at rest in me, and my words also abide in you. Now, when you come to verse 7, he was showing us the secret to answered prayer. That intimacy is also the key to answered prayer. In verse 7, he said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done. He said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. And it shall be done. What it means is that when you come to me, you rest in me, you sleep in me, and I also release my seed into you. You see, the word of God is seed. The word for word or seed in the Greek is sperma. So the word of God is seed. And it's like the sperm, the seed of the man. And so when we come to him and we abide in him, what happens is that he now releases his seeds into us. And his seeds carry his character, carry his vision, carry his passion, carry his interest, his ideas. And so when we enter the bedchamber, the secret place, the purpose is for him to release his seeds into us. Now, when he releases his seed, and his seed is released through the word, when you listen sit into you, then you take you become pregnant with the word. When you become pregnant with the word, that is when you see when a woman gets pregnant, her desires change. She will begin to desire certain things that she didn't even desire. Sometimes they have funny, funny cravings. Some of them have cravings for funny, funny things, you know, like. Some, some of them can have a craving for dust. Dust. Just by inhaling dust, then they are okay. It's funny, but it's natural. Now, the same thing applies to us when we abide in a secret place and he impregnates us with his word. Our desires will conform to his word. And so whatever we ask will be granted. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then whatever you ask, I will do. Because by that time, your desires will have been conformed to my desire. Because my word is my seed. It carries my desire. It carries my character. It carries my vision. It carries my purpose. So, by dwelling in the secret place for a long time, you will now get filled with his purpose. So, all your desire will be for his purpose. All your desire will be for his interest. So, Anything you ask him will be for his interest, and then he will answer it. Hallelujah. And that is that is what now in Psalm 91, the whole of Psalm 91 is for Christ, and the whole of Psalm 91 is for those who abide in Christ and those who dwell in the secret place. He said, He who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So all that is written in Psalm 91, the fact that he will give his angels charge concerning us, the fact that um, a thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, it shall not come near you, the, the fact that you will trample upon the snake, that you will tread upon the, the lion and the young adder, the young lion and the adder, and all that. The fact that um, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the that works in darkness. The fact that it shall not come near you, said, no evil shall befall you. 
Let us at any place come near your dwelling. Now all these things they are given on the premise of dwelling in the secret place. He said, "He that dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty." And then all these things will follow the person, which means that dwelling in the secret place is the secret. It is the secret of secrets. In fact, every success, every fruitfulness, every victory in the Christian life can be traced to the secret place. Because the secret place is the bed chamber of God. That is the manufacturing center of God. David said in Psalm 136, 139, he said, God saw my unformed part when I was curiously wrought in the secret place of the earth. He said, when I was curiously formed, being formed in the secret place of the earth, God's manufacturing chamber, secret. God, God, God's people, God's giants are molded in the secret place. Everything. So, it's very important that we pursue the secret place. And then we dwell there. When we, we get there, we, we dwell there. And then we are planted there. That is where our growth will come from. That is where our fruitfulness will come from. That is where our authority will come from. Ministry is birth in a secret place. That is where our giftings are birth. See, any gift you get outside the bedchamber of intimacy is suspect. Any gift that you get outside the bedchamber of intimacy with God is suspect. Any voice you hear outside a life of intimacy with God is suspect. So, the key to security, the key to security in the things of God is dwelling in the secret place. Now, so, when I talk about dwelling in the secret place, what I'm talking about is building an intimacy with God. Building intimacy with God. That is what makes the difference between Christians. The difference between Christians, the difference between fruitful, the, the levels of fruitfulness is how we are intimately connected to Him. And now, um, okay, let me let me let me give you this. There are three invitations that Jesus Christ gave when He came to this earth. Like I said last week, three invitations. One of the, the first one was come unto me. Second one was abide in me. And third one was follow me. Now, uh, in that order, come unto me, then abide in me, then follow me. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Abide in me, and you will bear fruits. Follow me, and you will have a ministry. So, we come unto him for rest. We abide in him for fruitfulness. And that we will follow him in ministry. In that order. If you reverse it. You reverse the order. It is a mistake. The order is that you abide in him. His words abide in you. Then you follow him in ministry. That's the order. Now. Intimacy with God. Is secret. It's secret. It is secret. What I mean by it's secret is that. It is between you and God. It is between you and God. Now, nobody wants to have intimate relationship with a spouse outside. When you, when you become born again, you become, you become more like a spouse of God. And he wants to impregnate you with his seed. That is why he needs you in a secret place. Unfortunately, what happens is that after the wedding, we are so um, fascinated by the wedding parcels and the wrappers and all that that we don't want to go to the secret place for our spiritual spouse to impregnate us. That is why a lot of times we have believers who are fascinated by the things of God but have no relationship with God. Even though contractually, legally, there's a relationship, but in reality, there's no relationship. 
because the marriage has not been consummated yet. Even in law, when you get married and by two years you have not had sex, by two years the marriage can be dissolved because it has not been consummated. So we have a lot of believers who are legally connected to Christ, but their marriage is not consummated and therefore there is no fruit because they refuse to go to the secret place, to go to the bedchamber of the bridegroom. Now, so God always wants secret. You see, everything about we and God is secret, but the results is public. Everything about intimacy is in the secret, but you will see the results in public. You will see the fruit in public. And that's how God said, that, 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 that is how God works. So, he wants you in a secret place. Then he will infuse you with a seed. Then publicly it will show. He said, Paul told Timothy, he said, Give yourself to these things. Meditate on them day and night. Till your progress appears to all. Till your profiting appears to all. Which means that something has taken place secretly. When nobody was watching. When nobody was there. But the result is there for all to see. That is how God deals with us. God enjoys secrets. Jesus said, Our Father who is in secret, in Matthew 6, 1 to 6, He said, When you pray, shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father in secret will hold you openly. So our Father is in secret. That is why I said, dwelling in the secret place. That is a non-negotiable key to fruitfulness or a fruitful life. He, he, he has secrets. Psalm 25 verse 14 says, The secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him. The secrets of the Lord. So he has secrets. Now Jesus said, not, not only does he have secrets, but he also dwells, he also is also in secret. He dwells in secrecy. He said, it is it is the glory of, 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 of it is the pleasure of God to hide things and the glory of kings to set out things. Number three, God also reveals secrets. Daniel 2 28. Daniel said, But there's a God in heaven who revealed secrets. So everything about God is secret. It's secret. Now, the most important part. Of our Christian life is the part that is lived in secret, in secrecy. That is the most important part. The most important part of a Christian life is the part that nobody sees. The part that happened between you and God. That is the most important part. That is where God places more premium. That is where your reward comes from. That is where God measures your weight, weighs you. That is where God. Your, your authority comes from. That is the most important part of the Christian life. If you are known in the secret place, you will know God's secrets. Because there are secrets and he dwells in secrecy. So if you dwell in the secret place, you have access to a secret. You see, do you know that there's a secret that you need to unlock your unique destiny? It's a secret. There is something that has your name on it. But there is a code that you will need to decode it. We call it secrets, destiny secrets. And when you dwell in the secret place, that is when your heavenly father will begin to give you your unique combination for you to be able to decode your destiny. That is why it's important to dwell in the secret place. And that is the most important part of the Christian life. What is not seen carries more weight than what is seen. What is not seen is more valuable than what is seen. In the sight of God, God values what is not seen more than what is seen. So the aspect of your Christian life that nobody sees, that is where, that is what God is interested in. Not what everybody sees. The one nobody sees, your approval comes from that place. That is why sometimes when people judge some people, God can come, come to their defense and say, 
Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Even though he has taken another wife. And Miriam was his sister. And Aaron was his brother. They said, what you have done is wrong. But God said, do you know that what goes on between me and him in the secret place? You don't know. Because his approval is from the secret place, not from the things that he does. God approved of Moses not because of passing the Red Sea, praying for uh, Christ to come, but because he spoke to Moses face to face in the secret place. So all your opinions don't matter to him. He is my friend. I know him in a secret place. Do you know what I have talked to him about this issue? And by the way, God never told them not to marry from Ethiopia. He only said, don't marry the Canaanites. But they, 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 they thought that once the one was not an Israelite, it was illegal. Now, so, if you look at the Bible, even in the tabernacle, the part of the tabernacle that was not seen was a part that God allowed them to decorate with gold. The Holy of Holies, from the holy place to the Holy of Holies, every article there was overlaid with pure gold. But that was a part that was restricted and people were restricted from entering. The Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant was there. The Ark of the Covenant was overlaid with pure gold. Everything there was gold. That shows how God thinks. That what is not seen carries more weight. I put more importance on what is not seen than what is seen. That's what he was trying to say. So he told someone, he said, look, Man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart, and the heart is not seen. So, God rates us by our heart, not by our actions. In heaven, our heart speaks louder than our mouth or our actions. He said he, he weighs actions, but our heart, in heaven, our heart speaks louder than our actions. Bible said, he said, let your beauty not be merely outward, but rather let it be of the hidden man of the heart, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. So even in beauty, God is saying that I am more interested in inner beauty than outer beauty. I am more interested in what man cannot see. That is why he places more importance on what happens in the sick place than what happens on the outside. What you do behind the scenes affects what you do on the screen. It's a principle of um, a communication. What you, that is why even when people are reading the news, they are programmed that, look, know that you can be caught at any time. So, whatever you are doing, you have, you, you, it must come from within, from inside. What you do, God is more interested in what you do behind the scenes than what you do on the screen. In other words, what you do for everybody to see, that's not what, that is not what God sees. It is what happened between you and him, secretly. Nobody knows. That is what pleases God. And if you want to please God, that is how we should think. If all the prayers that we pray are the ones we pray in public for people to see, then our prayer is small. If all the singing we do are the ones we do in public, then our singing doesn't please God. He wants it in the secret place. Before it comes out. Ministry to God. Comes before ministry for God. Ministering to God. Comes before ministering for God. We can minister for him. By running errands for him. Preaching. Teaching. Healing. Deliverance. Worship. Singing. All these things are ministering for him. But that one comes. After 
ministry to him. We are first of all ministers unto God before ministers unto people. So if you have not sung to God in the sacred place, don't come and sing to people. If you have not talked to God in a secret place, don't come and talk to people. We need to have our priorities right so that we know. In 2 Timothy 2 15, Paul said, study to show yourself approved unto God. Study to show yourself approved unto God, not unto man. Unto God. God is our number one audience. In fact, He should be our only audience. Then when you spend time in a secret place, God will not allow you to stay there forever. God will also release you to go out. But as you are going out, you are going with Him. That is the order of God. That's the order. So, God respects or God values the intimacy above the service. Relationship comes before service in the things of God. That is why in the Bible you see the seraphim who dwell in the throne room of God. You see that they have six wings. They use two to cover their, their faces and two to cover themselves and only two to fly. So they need more ways to just stand in his presence than to fly and run errands. That tells says that God places more importance on abiding in the secret place than running out to run errands for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at Mary and Martha. It was Martha who brought Jesus to the house. But the Bible says that she had a sister called Mary. And this Mary took a chair and sat at the feet of Jesus. Listen to him. Let's read Luke 10, 38. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into a house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to come to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are here. And troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part. Which will not be taken away from her. Look at Jesus. This matter was the one who brought him to her house. And Jesus often worked with a large crowd. So Martha saw the need to prepare food for Jesus. And she went to the kitchen to prepare food. But Mary took a chair. And sat down and was just conversing with Jesus. Now, to Martha, Mary was just idle and lazy. That is why she was conversing with Jesus. And I am the only one in the kitchen cooking. And so she came to complain to Jesus. Jesus that, look, my sister has left me alone in the kitchen to cook for you and your crowd. And look at her doing nothing but talking and listening. And Jesus said, Martha. You think about many things, but only one thing is needful. One thing. And that one thing, Mary has chosen. So, Jesus placed Mary's attitude higher in terms of importance and premium than Martha's attitude. What Martha was doing was not wrong. Service is good. But he was trying to say that Relationship should come before service. So, don't just cook for me. How would you know whether what you are cooking for me, I like it or not? Unless you sit down, converse with me, get to know me, and know what I like. So, after you've gotten to know me, if you are cooking for me, 
you can know exactly what I like. So Jesus didn't discount matters. He didn't say, no, don't say, no. But he's, he was trying to say, look, you are, you are putting the, 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 the cat before the horse. That the, what you can first is relationship. Then out of that, you see, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me show you something. When you check through the Bible, Mary and Martha, after this time, the next time they appeared in the Bible was in John 11. In John 11, when Lazarus, their brother, died, look what happened. Now, Jesus was called, and Jesus came there. Now, listen, when Jesus was called, he, he loved Lazarus, right? He loved Lazarus. So they called him that the one that you love is sick. Human, human as we are, our first response or reaction would have been, Oh, let me close everything I'm doing and attend to Lazarus because he's sick. I love him. Two or four. But Jesus spent two more days. And so by the time he got there, Lazarus was dead for four days. When he met Martha, I believe Martha had many things to tell him. But because he was a man of God, she restrained herself. Because if you truly love us, why did you wait for him to die? And look at these Jews. They are not even family members. You, Jesus, you come to my house. I cook for you to eat. My brother is sick. Come and lay hands. You have delayed two days and now he's dead. So what are, what are you going to do now? That was what he was, he was saying. You know. But she said, Oh Lord, if you had come earlier, my brother would have died. That, but what she was saying was that, Look, you... I've been cooking for you for so many years. And just, so some in Bethany too was a walking distance. And just walking from this place to that place, come and pray for my brother, you didn't come. Sometimes, our idea of love is not God's idea of love. You may think that because God loves you, God might deliver you from the problem. No, 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 no. But because he loves you, he will wait for the thing to be worse. So that, when the thing is rotten and all the Jews have gathered around your house that you're working, he said, Where have you placed him? They said, Go and show me. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Then, when he came forth, everybody now saw it. Every, all the Jews saw it. But that's what I'm talking about. This is by the way. What I'm talking about really is that when he came, Martha went to meet him and said, Oh, well. If you had come earlier, our brother wouldn't have died. Look how Mary did. In um, Luke 11, verse, verse 20 is when Martha said it. Now, look, okay, let me read Martha's home. Now, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, my brother will not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Now, come to verse 32. 31. Then the Jews were with her in the house and comforted her. When they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her. Okay, now verse 28. Verse 28. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. You see, Jesus got there, and Martha was the first one to go out. And look at what Martha said. He said, If I've been here, you wouldn't have died. There. So now come to verse 32. The when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She fell down at the feet of Jesus. You see, Mary was addicted to his feet. The first time, Mary said, she sat at his feet. Now she fell down at his feet. Martha was just talking to him. Oh, you have been If you had come earlier, you would not have died and all that. But Mary fell at his feet. 
There was something about Jesus' feet that attracted Mary. There was something about, and, you, and, and when you fall at somebody's feet, it means that you, you've come down. I'm trying to let you know, in order of priority and importance, Mary's attitude. Now, come to the next chapter, chapter 12. Then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Then they made him a supper, and Martha said, have you seen? Martha said the game. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spider, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now, look at Mary again. Look at Mary again. Now she's anointing the feet of Jesus and wiping his feet with her hair, her glory. The hair of a woman is her glory. And she was not afraid to wipe her. I mean, Jesus fit with her glory. That is worship. Look at the two of them. Martha cooked for Jesus. Jesus ate the food. The food came out. I mean, you understand, it came out. Now, Mary also did something for Jesus. I'm talking about worshipful service. When you go in the secret place, even your service becomes worshipful. It becomes worship. Mary anointed Jesus and Jesus Christ and said, what she has done will, will be a memorial. She has done something against the day of my burial. And I tell the truth, wherever this gospel is preached, what Mary has done, what should be said. That was eternal work. So, if you are somebody addicted to his feet, your works will be eternal. Your service will assume eternal dimension. But if your only interest is in running errands for him, you will not last. And that's the difference between Mary and Martha. That is why now Mary's work was accepted. Look at what she did. She bought perfume, uh, uh, oint, uh, ointment, costly one. It, 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 could, it could cover an entire year's wage. And then she bought it. Very expensive. Then she poured it on Jesus. And then used her hair to wipe his feet. And the disciples, Judas and Scarlet said, Why this waste? Why this waste? Why are you wasting this? This, this thing could have been sold. And the money given to the poor. It's given to the poor as sin. It's not a sin. But what Jesus, Jesus said, Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. But what she has done, she has done a good work and an eternal work against the day of my burial. What I mean is that religious spirit, you see, there is not, there is no limit to how far you can go to be with God. How far, that there is no sin to the importance we must place on our intimacy with God. Nothing should come between us and our God in terms of intimacy. It is religion that places service before relationship. And that's what Jesus, 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 Jesus was trying to do. Now, let's sell the, 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 the perfume and give the money to the poor as if he cared for the poor. But he said, he said why this waste? Why this waste? And Jesus said, yes, it is good for her to waste her money, her time, everything on me. What is the object of your love? God's real intention for us is for us to come to him so that he can infuse us with his seed. That is where ministry begins. Ministry doesn't begin with hands being laid on you. That's what ministry doesn't begin when hands are laid on you. 
and then you receive a gift. No, ministry begins in the secret place when the mandate, when the blueprint, when his seed has impregnated you in the secret place. Nobody knows. It is between you and God. Then when it begins to flow out of you, that is ministry. So ministry is an overflow of your intimacy with him. Overflow. God has always desired intimacy. Right from the Garden of Eden, the Bible says, and God came down in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife ran away from God. What was he coming to do? He was coming to have fellowship with, 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 his, with his children. The first time, the pastor went to church, and the members ran away. Genesis 3. He said, he came in the cool of the day, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, meaning in the morning. The morning is the cool of the day, not the evening, the morning. The cool of the day is the morning. And so he came in the morning, coming to have fellowship with them. In the cool breeze of the morning. When he got there, bam, they were all gone. God desires intimacy. That is what he wanted to do with the people of Israel. When he brought them, when he was giving Moses instruction, he said, look, you are going to take them from Egypt and you are bringing them to me. He said, you are bringing them to me here, to serve me here. He didn't tell you that you are taking them to a promise. He said, you are bringing them to me and they will worship me on this mountain, Mount Sinai. It was after that that his real purpose was released to them. So when they go to Sinai, and God wanted to come and have intimacy with them. The people said, no, no, no. No, we don't, we don't want you. God's real intention was to make all of them priests and kings. In Exodus 19, verse 25, he said, I will make you a kingdom of priests. So God came down, but sinful humanity could not endure his presence. So they said, it's enough. No, we can't, we can't abide even his voice. So Moses, you go and hear, listen to him. Come and tell us. That was when they put a rift between themselves and God. But that was never God's intention. He never intended that man should be a mediator between him and his people. But they said, we can't we can, we, we, we can listen to him. You go and listen to him and come and tell us and we'll, we'll listen to you, Moses, rather. That was when the plan changed. That was when then after that, then God said, I've chosen Levi to be the priest. At first, God's intention was everybody will be a priest and a king. That is why in the New Testament, he has achieved, he has achieved that purpose. Now he has made us kings and priests, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Royal priesthood, which means every believer is a priest. We can go directly to God. Have intimacy with him. God asked Moses to build a tabernacle for him. And the tabernacle of Moses had three sessions. Had the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. God was in the holy of holies in the ark of the covenant. Now, the people went to the outer court to offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins and to receive blessing from the priest. But the people could not go to the Holy of Holies. And so the people didn't even bother to know what was in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go there. But some time later, when David came on the scene, David carried the Ark of the Covenant from um, the, the, the house of Obededom and then went and put it in Jerusalem. Before David came, Saul came. Saul never, never inquired about the ark. In fact, he used the ark once for war. After that, he abandoned the ark. So for 14 years, the ark of God was abandoned in, in somewhere. Then David went and decided to bring the ark back to God, to Jerusalem. When he was coming, uh, God killed Uzzah. Then David abandoned the ark in the house of Obededom. Later on, David went for the ark and brought the ark to Jerusalem. 
on Mount Zion and he pitched a tent, a tabernacle, a tent, and placed the ark in the tent. Now, so in the time of David, there were two tabernacles in Israel. One was David's tabernacle on Mount Zion, and the other was Moses' tabernacle on Mount Gibeah. But Moses' tabernacle didn't have an ark in it. In fact, for 70 years, there was no ark in Moses' tabernacle. But the people didn't even know. They didn't even know. In fact, there was no difference in their lives. Because after all, they had no access to the ark. But in David's ark, David's tabernacle, the ark was, there were no veils, so people could just go there and worship God. They saw the ark with their eyes. They stood just a few meters from the ark and they were worshiping God. And David instituted the first 20, 20, uh, 24 hour worship service around the ark. They, they, they ran shifts. And there was no blood, sacrifice, anything in David's tabernacle. So David's tabernacle represented God's ideal plan for his people. That they could just come boldly to the ark and enjoy intimacy with him. But look at the two tabernacles. They represent the two kinds of Christians we have today. There are some Christians who are only interested in the outer court, God meeting our needs and, and we sacrificing our, our sheep for our sins and all that. But no, nothing about entering to the holy place to have intimacy with the Father. So if you were there in David's time and you wanted intimacy, you go to David's tabernacle. If you wanted religion, you go to Moses' tabernacle. Because there, it was just rich ones without any relationship. Because there was no act in the Holy of Holies. But the New Testament, God has made it possible for us to have unbroken fellowship with Him. Because He has washed away our sins. He has given us a new spirit and a new heart. So in the New Testament, we have every access, every right to go to God. His bedroom door is always open to the New Testament believer. But even that, we don't take advantage. We always want people to go there, come and tell us what is inside there. Meanwhile, you can also go there. God always works for us and we don't come. Even today, in the New Testament church, even today, many believers want the men of God to act as mediators between them and God. Which is very wrong. Every believer has equal access to God. Equal access. The same access you, you have, the same access he has. The same access the man of God has. The man of God is not closer to God. He has the same degree of access. The reason why he is closer is because he chose to go closer. The anointing didn't bring him closer. No. Imagine you have a friend who is close to the president. And he even gets to go to the president's bedroom. I mean, he's his close friend. He can enter his bedroom. And you have a petition for the president. And you give it to your friend. Wouldn't you count it as done? Wouldn't you count it as done? Because you know that he's so close to the president. Guess what? You are in the place of that friend. Because you are also so close to him that you can, you can get to him without anybody. Nobody's permission. Direct access. There's no branch to the vine that grows on another branch. Every branch is directly attached to the vine. So we shouldn't live our life as if we don't qualify to go to God. That this person qualifies to go to God. No. That is why the duty of the fivefold is to teach the people that you too can go to God for yourself. You don't need me to go to God. You can
can go to God for yourself. You can speak to God. God can speak to you. God can direct you. God can instruct you. God can listen to you. No need for a mediator anymore. No need. That is why I tell people that look, you better learn how to build a relationship with God because one day your pastor's phone will be off. One day your pastor's phone may be off. And you need to get out of God. You better learn how to pray yourself because one day the one who, who is your prayer warrior may not be able to pray for you. Why? Because you too have direct access to the Father. Why don't you take advantage of that, the open door? Why do you want people to go and come and tell what is there? Why can't you also go there and find out what is there? And tell people. We are priests. Hallelujah. Therefore, we determine the level of intimacy that we have with God, not God. It is not God who determines it. We determine it. He said, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. So, we determine how intimate we are with God. It's not God who determines how close we can come. He says, come boldly. We determine how close we can get to God. Everybody can be as close to anybody in the Bible, I'm, I'm as close to God as anybody in the Bible was. It's a choice. If you decide that from today you are going to go in a secret place, you are going to go, you are going to graduate and build a relationship with God. I tell you, at, we, 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 in no time you 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 will develop some confidence that you don't know where you came from because. You can also decide that I'm building my relationship with God to the extent that I mean, I, I want to hear God talk to me. I mean, enough of God has spoken to me that I should tell you this or that. That one is also there. But the certain things, God must speak to you personally. Do you know that you have a more right to know about your personal destiny than any prophet? He says, who knows the things of a man save the spirit that is in the man? Your spirit knows your destiny more than I know. But the problem is that because sometimes we have not developed the intimacy, we can't pick the information up in the spirit. So we have to rely on somebody. That is why we must make it a point that we are going to storm the secret place. We are going to storm the place. We are going to storm that is door. That is door is always open for us. We can be as close to God as anybody in the Bible was. We can be as close to God as Enoch was. He said, Enoch walked with God. The first man that the Bible said who walked with God. And he was not for God took him. He got to a point. God said, I won't let you go back. Come. God took him. He was so over into the supernatural, over into the spirit that God said, no, stay here. One day, he just went. God just took him. But you know, do you know that it was Adam who taught Enoch? Because when Enoch was born, Adam was dead. It was Adam who taught all of them about the fact that you can, you can, you can get close to God. But they even got closer to God than Adam. Because there is no respect of person with God. You can have somebody who is a believer today. By six months time, the person has grown. Why? Because the person stopped the secret place. He was, somebody taught him quite time. And he stuck to it faithfully. And you can see his growth is now evident to all. Now, how do we go to a secret place? Number one, come boldly. Hebrews 4.16. It says, come 
boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly. So we go there just out. Boldly. Because we are qualified to go there. Nothing should stop you from going before God. Nothing. And I mean nothing. Nothing. We should come boldly to him. He knows why he added boldly. Because he knows some religious spirits will prevent us from coming to him. So, religious spirits will, will tell you that, look, you don't, you don't qualify, you don't measure up, you know. You know, you are like this, you are like that, you don't measure up. But say, come boldly to the throne of grace. If we can come boldly, then we will have full access to the throne of grace. Then we will find grace to help in time of need. Then we will also have mercy. If Adam had been bold to face God, I believe the story would have been different. If he had been bold to say, yes, I'm here. Yes, I did this, I did that. I mean, I believe it would have been different. Number two, Come daily. Come daily. The invitation is daily. Christianity is a daily affair. That talks about consistency. Not spending 10 hours with God today and then next month you spend 10 hours. God prefers the one who spends 10 minutes every day. To the one who spends 10 hours monthly. Because the, the thing is that consistency, it builds muscles. Consistency. You see, the law of growth. Growth is not measured in meters. It's measured in inches. So, every day, something small is added. Daily. It's a daily affair. He said, Christianity is a daily thing. Now, the Bible says, take up your cross. Daily, Luke 9 23. Take up your cross daily, not weekly, not monthly, daily. Call upon him daily. Psalm 88, verse 9. Call upon him daily. He said, He loves us with daily benefits. Psalm 68, verse 19. Daily benefits. The benefits that God gives us daily. That is why even one day, if you miss. If you miss the, the meeting, the secret place meeting, you have missed a daily blessing. Because there's a daily benefit that you must go for. Daily strength. Daily strength. Because temptation to is daily. He said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So every day has enough evil to overcome you. I mean to fight you. Enough evil to disturb you every day. That's why you need enough strength every day. So the Christian life is lived one day at a time. Every day, give me the strength I need today. I tell you, Buddha, look, if you are struggling with something, you see, you must take it daily. Father, today, give me strength over this. I mean, daily. Don't, don't ask for tomorrow's strength. Ask for today's strength. What tomorrow comes, for today's prayer. He said, what it is called today, if you hear my voice, today. You know, Delilah tempted something daily. Judge 16, 16. He said, daily she pressed him, daily. Then one day, one day, he gave up. Daily. So the Christian life is a daily thing. Daily sacrifice. Daniel 11, 31. The Antichrist will abolish daily sacrifice. Acts 17, 11. The believers say the scriptures daily. The saints in Berea, they say the scriptures daily to see whether the thing that Paul was saying was, was true. Daily. God loves routine. He loves routine. Check the way 
he, he gives instructions in the Old Testament. So the way he went with people of Israel, he lost routine. There are certain things they were doing daily. Every day. The same thing. Every day. Never get tired. In the Old Testament, they were to gather the manna daily. Our daily manna. Every day. The only exception was on Fridays where they gathered two days because Sabbath day you can't gather, you can't go out to gather manna. It won't even come. But every day and the manna they needed. You see, every day and the bread you need. Every day and the wine you need for the day. Give us this day our daily bread. Not only by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Give us this day our daily bread means give me this day the word I will need to live. The woman word, the taba word. The fire in the tabernacle was to be lit daily. Leviticus 6, 12. The fire came from God. But how to be sustained daily. They put oil in it every morning. That was in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, if we are priests, then we must, we must also tend the lambs and the oil every day. We must have fellowship with God every day. Every day. You have fellowship with God every day. It's, it's an appointment with God. You see, God so much respects it that to the extent that sometimes He will go there to wait for you. Now, let, let, let me read uh, Ezekiel 16, verse 4. Ezekiel 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will work in my law or not. Look at how God is testing them. Whether they, they will go and gather the manna every day or not. He said, If you don't go out every day, it means you can't work in my law. He said, I will know whether they will work in my law if they will obey this. I'm just let you if they can get a manner every day. We shouldn't joke with our daily fellowship with God. Very important. Very, very important. Nothing should stop us. Nothing should come between us and that appointment. Nothing. Should come between us and that appointment. Nothing. We should have a consistent daily. Every day storm the secret place. Every day enter the secret place. Every day. All the great men in the Bible. They had a daily appointment with God. They respected the secret of the secret place. The secret of daily appointment with God. I've not even talked about what to do when, when you enter the secret place. I'm now, uh, today I can't, I can't talk about that. But I'm just talking about the importance of going to a secret place every day. Look at Jesus. Jesus, in, in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Mark 1, 35, and all of them were early risers. Early risers. Early risers. All the great men of God in the Bible, there were people who were early risers. They would, they would rise up early in the morning to, to talk to God. Now I know there are people who are also late sleepers. But you see that the morning and the evening, they cross at 12 midnight. So you cross over at 12 midnight. 
So if you are somebody who does all night, night vigil, you are also part of the early risers because uh, you will cross over. But no matter what, all the great men in the Bible were early risers. Jesus Christ in Mark 135. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a little place and then he prayed. He said, having risen long while before daylight, which means that it was early in the morning. Though, in fact, if you check the Bible, Jesus always came around three to four. The fourth watch. That was when they were on the sea that he came. When they were on the sea fighting against the wind, then he came. He has spent the whole night in prayer on the mountain. Then on the fourth watch at four, he came walking on the water. As I said, in the cool of the day, he always wants the cool of the day. When everything is silent, that is when he wants. So, when you sleep and you wake up at six, you will see that already the day has gone ahead of you. Yes, you, you, you will see that already the day has gone ahead of you. But when you get up, boom, you take charge of the whole day. Moses, Exodus 34, verse 2 to 3. He rose, he rose early in the morning to be with God. David, Psalm 5, verse 1. He said, early in the morning you will hear my prayer. Early in the morning you will hear my cry. David, Joshua, Joshua 6, 5. All of them were early risers. Jacob, Genesis 28, verse 18. They were early risers. Early risers. So, if we can build a relationship with God, we must be early risers. People who rise up early enough to take charge of the day. To fellowship with God. I'm not saying it is a law. What I'm saying is that it's a pattern. Because so, there are some people who say that, oh, me, the time that works for me is 3 p.m. Fine. If that is the time that works for you, fine. There are some people who may say that, I, I enjoy it, me see when it's 6 p.m. Fine. It's, it's not a law. But the pattern in scripture is that all of them were early riders. They had an appointment with God in the morning. Look at the example of Jesus. A great while before dawn, he rose and then he went to pray. What was he doing? He was going to receive instructions for the day. Going to receive direction for the day. Going to receive strength for the day. Going to receive wisdom for the day. No wonder they, they marveled at the kind of wisdom he had. They came to test him. Then he gave them a word of wisdom. They were, they were shocked. He said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, or to God what is God's. Now the last one, come alone. Come alone. So the first one is come boldly, come daily, and come alone. Suppression is the key to intimacy. When you are alone, that is when he deals with you. Don't come as a group. Come alone. People believe in morning devotion. Group morning devotion is good. But that should not take the place of the one day you the time you spend alone with him. That is the secret to intimacy. Alone. Alone. Come to Exodus 34. The example of Moses. Exodus 34, verse 1 to 3. And Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first one, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. You see, Moses was using tablets. 
Somebody was asking me to tell okay, said, um, he, he sent me a message and he didn't get me. And my, my WhatsApp was on my tablet. So I, I said, I left my tablet at home. Then he said, ah, why don't you carry it? I said, I'm not Moses, I'm Joseph. It was Moses that was carrying tablets. Verse 2. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you. And let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor heads feed before that mountain. No man shall come with you. No man. Not even Joshua. So what Joshua did? Joshua will wait when Moses comes out. He too will go and have his time with God. Oh, what else he was doing? Joshua. Anytime Moses will come out, then Joshua too will go. And then he will have his time with God. But Moses never went with anybody. He went alone. He went alone. Now, come to Genesis 32, verse 24. Genesis 32, 24. It says, Then Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him unto the breaking of day. It was when he was alone that God came to wrestle with him. Because the key to intimacy is separation. Sometimes, when God wants to deal with you, he will separate you from people. Sometimes, if you are stubborn, he will hear himself will separate you. Then he will start dealing with you. Because nobody wants intimacy to, to be done outside. Alone. In Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 4, he said, Draw me into your secret chamber and we will run after you. He said, Draw me. God will draw you alone to a secret place. When you come out, then you will come with a crowd. But he will draw you alone to work on you. So, in a secret place, as we abide in a secret place, that is when the order is you come, then you abide, then you follow him. That is when true ministry is birth. That is why I tell people, don't think you are in ministry if you don't have a consistent devotional life with God. Don't think you are doing ministry if you don't have a consistent devotional life with God. And if you are the your life, your personal devotion with God is not consistent and it's not flowing and you are hearing voices. Doubt the voices. Hmm. Because outside the bedchamber secret place, you can easily be deceived. In the outer court, you are exposed to the sun Sometimes you will be influenced by the sun. You don't know. You, you think it is God. Because you are in the outer court. But it's when you press deep right secret place. That is in the secret place. Holy of Holies. There is no light. There is no light. The only light is in the holy place. Where the candlestick is. Holy of Holies is dark. That is where God wants. That is where God will speak to you. When you are at the outer court, the sun may be influencing you. There are many people operating gifts and they are under the influence of familiar spirit. They don't even know. Familiar spirit. Because the person is not in the secret place. It's the outer court. That is why I say that if you want to do ministry, develop a consistent devotional life. Let it be consistent. Let that be an addiction. Almost an addiction. That you always have to be in a secret place. You always have to go before the Father. You always have to 
We always have to have fellowship with him. Almost an addiction. Then God can take you seriously. If you fail this test, you cannot pass the test of ministry. He said, this is the test I'm giving you so that I will know that you will walk in my commandments. That is why I tell you that the secret to overcoming every struggle is developing a consistent devotional life. It's not like trying to break the habit. You can't. Don't even try because you can't. Just be there. Appointment, just be there. Every morning, just be there. Every time, just be there. By the time you realize that thing is gone, you won't even know how it left you. It will just leave you like that. Because you have passed the first test. That is where you are changed. He said, but we all with unveiled forces, beholding him as in the mirror, are being transformed into the same image as he is. From glory to glory. That takes place in the secret place. It takes place as we engage him secretly when nobody is. It, that is where God will speak to you. That's where God will point out your faults to you. That's where God will point out your motives to you. That's where God will rush you. That is where God will speak to you. We are changed. To be place. That is where we are trained to hear his voice. Isaiah 50 verse 4. He said, He awakens my ear. To hear. Morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear. That is where we learn to hear God's voice. We learn to hear God's voice in the secret place. You see, right now, if your mother comes here, your mother comes to this room, and there are so many people, your mother stands outside and he says, Kojo, will you hear her voice? Will you hear her voice? Yeah. You will hear her voice. If there's so many people in this room and my wife is standing outside and she calls me, I will hear her voice because I, I know how she will call me. Yeah. You will hear her because, because of intimacy. Now, when my wife calls me, when she mentions my name, I know exactly what is going to follow? Whether there's a problem or whether it is good news or bad news, I know exactly because I've lived with her for some few years. So as you build a relationship with God, you begin to know how God speaks to you because God speaks to us in unique ways. Don't rely on the gift of word of knowledge to think that God is not going to speak to you by that. That is why many prophets marry witches. Yeah. That is why a prophet can show you your wife. But he will go and marry a witch. Because when it comes to hearing God, it is your intimacy. That's where you learn to hear the voice of God. What comes on you for you to tell me my name is a gift? It's not intimacy. It's a gift. If that, if, that, if that same gift comes on this person, you will be able to see your name, your details. It's a gift. Just like healing. Gift of healing. If it comes on this person, you will learn so you should have you are healed. It's a gift. But to hear God for your own affairs, you must spend time in a secret place. Develop the relationship. He said, my sheep know me and they hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. We find rest in secret place. That is where we find rest. Jeremiah 50 verse 6. I'm ending. Jeremiah 50 verse 6. Look at the picture of today's uh, Christianity. In Jeremiah 50 verse 6. That's the exact picture of today's Christianity. It says, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from a mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. 
They have gone from mountain to hill. From one high point to another high point. Because they have forgotten their resting place. When you develop a secret place lifestyle, you develop confidence. Because you know how God speaks to you and you are confident. The reason why sometimes we run helter skelter is because we have not been in the secret place. When you go to the secret place and God speaks to you, that gives you peace. That gives you rest. You will not be in a hurry. Somebody said, a missionary is not a mission in a hurry. That is why you will bear fruit. And like I said, fruit cannot be copied. Fruit can only be born. You cannot copy fruit. So the five virgins said, Go and buy your own oil. For ours is not enough to share with you. You see, when you come, when the rubber meets the, the road, you come to the issues of this life. Somebody's oil will not be enough. You must go for your own oil. It gets to a point. You must go for your own oil. A time comes in your life, you must enough of people carry you on their oil. Now go for your own oil. That is when you now buy the truth. There are some scriptures that will become so personal to you because now you are buying the truth. And the way we go for our own oil is in the secret place. Let me tell you, don't let anybody deceive you. That you will get anointing by oil being splashed on you. You can get an impartation. I mean, yes. But to get your own oil, you must go there. Spend your own time. Pay your own price. Fast your own fast. Read your own reading. Write your own writing. If we can come out as unique people, with our uniqueness, not borrowed anointing, we must, of all the impartation that we have received, there is one that we can never do without. That is the one that you yourself you receive in the secret place. You can receive many impartations from many people. Many, many people, anointed people can lay hands on you and give you impartation. But they will not amount to anything if you have not been there. To get your own. Because a time will come. It is what you have. What you have that will take you. Not what somebody has given you. Finally. That is the place where battles are won. It's a great place. That is where battles are won. When somebody prays for you. You know what happens? You are set free. When you storm the secret place, you secure the freedom of generations. When battles are won on your knees, you don't only secure your freedom, you secure the freedom of generations. People tied to your loins are also liberated. Because you have been to that place and you have won the battle. When the battle is won in a secret place, it is won. That is why sometimes when battles are won in dreams, you see the manifestation. So when you have a dream and you tell me that, oh, I had a dream and somebody came to attack me and, and I was able to hit the person. I said, oh, no need to pray about it. It is victory. It means you have secured the victory. I had a dream recently, last, last, last week or last two weeks. No, last week. Somebody had killed somebody. And I, I said, let's pray for the person to come back to life. So the person was there. So we're praying for the person to come back to life. Then the one who killed the person, I didn't know he killed the, the, the woman. The one who killed the woman rushed to the place and said, why are you trying to wake her up? Raise her up. Is she your, is she your sister? It's my
my sister, I, I've, I've killed her. So in the dream, I said, hey, if you have killed her, I remove the death and I give it to you. That was all in the dream. That was all. Four days later, pa, she was gone. Just last week. When it happened in the dream, four days later, the, the, the one who said, I didn't see the face, but it was the person's sister, who said, I have killed my sister. Four days later, she was gone. Why? Because the battle was won in the spirit. I didn't, I, I didn't pray physically against her. It happened in the spirit. Last year, the same thing happened. Last year, the people came, just when I saw her face, came against me in a dream. In the dream, I commanded fire to come and burn them. Fire came and burned them in the dream. Then I told their family, I said, I fear for so and so's life. Some few weeks after, I think two weeks or so, another dream, this one was so clear. Bah, the same thing. The following morning, bah, she was dead. I will never pray for anybody to die. Never. I will not do that. That I, I will pray for it. No, I will not do that. I will not bless you. But if it happens in the spirit, that is not me. So, you, then nobody can say, ah, I didn't pray to kill him. She was coming to attack me in the spirit. And the power of God killed her. So, any battle you win in the spirit is won. Any battle you win in the secret place is won. So, determine that there are certain things you go to God on your knees and pray through. Somebody can help you in prayer. Place yourself under authority and then storm the place. Maybe it's a family issue. Place yourself under authority and under covering. And then begin to deal with it. You will see the result. That when the results come, it is going to be lasting. Sometimes it will take months, but don't give up. Just continue to storm and pray. Later, I will show you what to do when you enter your prayer closet. What do you do when you go to your prayer closet? How do you even have your, your, your devotion? Let's be on our feet. I want us to pray this prayer. We are, we are telling God, give us the grace. The, the grace to always come boldly. The grace to come boldly to the throne of grace every day. The grace to make it daily. Let's begin to pray. Oh, Sibahata Yakaba. Mandoraboko Sibahata. Lo brahati yakaba halosi. Bito boho saha. Makuyandi yahalaga. O mahanda. Ni proto sitaha. Makalando sibrahataha. O samahandi kaha. Kamalando rebohashi. Ni bobo kinahata. In the name of Jesus. Give us grace, O God. Grace to make it every day. Grace to make it an addiction. Grace to be addicted to you, O God. To be addicted to fellowship and prayer. To be addicted to the secret place. Grace to stay in the throne of grace every every day. Call Iba Hatayala. Losa Mahataya Kataboshi. Mandala Katara Bakata. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 We are praying this prayer also. We are asking God. Asking God for the grace of persistence. That spirit that doesn't give up easily. That will cause us to stand and stay and remain. That's, that spirit of consistency that will help us not to give up no matter what we see or we don't see. So that we can pay it out to the end. Let's begin to pray. Libro to Shahanda. Libra Kataya Labaha. Lo 
Zande Akata, Leo Mante Akabala Hose, Librando Siko Hose, Mandere Vicotorobose, Maloko Hosia, Mika Bando Shikaha, Mande Broko Loseha, Mandere Vocotaha, Vitor Vocoshi Prohota, Ima Torohota, Losikaha Mahata. Give us grace for consistency, O God. Grace for persistence, O God. In the name of Jesus. Persistence, O God. Persistence, O God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're praying this last prayer. We're praying for this nation. We are asking for the peace of God to be released. Let the hand of God come down strongly. For good on this nation, let the hand of God orchestrate things according to the will of God. We are superimposing the will of God upon the will and the agenda of any human being, any political party, any entity. We are superimposing God's will. What God, where God wants Ghana to go this election, where God wants Ghana to go this year. Where God was going to be in next year, we are praying that it is superimposed on what anybody wants. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus, let your will for this nation be done, O oh God. We superimpose your will over the will of any man, the will of any political party. In the name of Jesus, let your perfect will be done. Let your perfect will work out for this nation be done. In the name of Jesus. Kau sabahata ya laha. Lo sikrahata. Lo pahandi kata. We come against powers that will seek to pervert the will of God and the ways of God. In the name of Jesus. We ask the Lord's rebuke to them. In Jesus' name. We go ko shikaha. La mahantariyana. Give us peace, O God. Give us favor, O God. We declare Ghana will not die. This country will live. This country will fulfill her purpose in the peace of God. Ghana will experience a mighty revival that will spread to all over the world. In the name of Jesus, the enemy cannot stop it. It will surely come to pass. For that is what God has decreed and what God has established in the spirit. And we are saying that we are bringing it down in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We thank you for your word. We pray with God. Help us. Help us to be addicted to the throne room. Help us, Lord, to be people of the throne room. That that time, when Peter and Co were born for the order of Israel, they took note that I had been with Jesus. Help us to be with Jesus, that our prophecy and our progress may appear in public. We thank you, we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.